country. All right. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Will, but you guys all know me, so <coughs> sorry really to do that. Um, who, just go ahead and raise your hand, who in this room wants to lose? Who loves to be a <laughs> loser? Yes, you? <laughs> um, maybe it's you, Michael? You like to lose? <laughs> no? Yes. Okay. No one, no one likes to lose, right, if we're honest. No one wants to be a loser. We want to be winners. We want to win. Um, unfortunately for me, when I was a kid, I lost a lot. Um, I lost a lot at sports. Um, my first and only year of baseball, I ended up somehow on the worst team in the league, and we won zero games. Uh, we were so bad that uh, I barely could even throw the ball, let alone pitch, and somehow I ended up as the pitcher one game, and I threw the first inning, I threw to three, di three different people, and the first person I pegged, the second person I pegged, the third person I pegged. And I didn't do it on purpose, like that would have been funny, right? But um, like the little strike zone, I was going for it as best as I could, and I just sucked so bad, I, I couldn't do it. I really couldn't do it. And that just kind of like shows how bad our team really was. I went in and I was that bad. Um, and then, I was like, you know what, I am done with baseball. I'm not doing baseball anymore, this sucks. I don't like to lose. So I started Junior All-American. I decided to do football. Well, um, that didn't go so well for me either. I also ended up on the worst team in the league and we won one game. I specifically remember playing against Rancho Cucamonga. And I don't know what it is about Rancho Cucamonga, but the kids there, they just grow up like way quicker than faster than everybody else. And they were so big and so strong that like when you, in football when you go to block, you're supposed to like settle your feet right and hit them right in their rib cages. Well, they didn't do that because they didn't need to do that. Instead, they would run full speed, dive through the air like legitimately horizontally and just smash us like, like spears, <laughs> smash us into the ground. And I remember that was the only football game I've ever played in my entire life where I was just like, I want to quit. I just want to leave. I want to go home. Like, mommy, I want you. It was bad. And then I, I switched from Junior All-American to Pop Warner, hoping it would be better, and we still were terrible. And then, long behold, high school, my freshman year, football. I was like, this is it, man. We're going to be winners this season. I'm sick of losing. Uh, it's going to be good. And we had a good team. Um, Preseason was great. Our first two scrimmages. We won 707s. We won. We hadn't lost before the season started. Season starts. First game. Guess what happened? We won. We won. And then our second game, we won. Our third game, we won. Our fourth game, we won. And then all the rest of the games, we lost. <laughs> so I was sitting there and I'm like, man, I'm a winner for once. I'm winning. I'm winning. It feels so good. And then I was right where I started, losing all the time. And it sucked. And I think that there's something really to be learned about this, because I think that it's in our nature to actually desire and want to win. I seriously think that God made us to want to win. And in Psalm 15, I think David talks about how to win, not in sports, but in life. How can we win at life? How can we seriously win? And, and if he's talking about that, that's something um, we want to know if we want to win. So let's read Psalm 15 um, with me. If you're not there, um, maybe you want to get there or just listen goes like this. O Lord, who shall sojourn in your tent? Who shall dwell on your holy hill? He who walks blamelessly and does what is right and speaks truth in his heart, who does not slander with his tongue and does no evil to his neighbor, nor takes up reproach against his friend, and whose eyes a vile person is despised, but who honors those who fear the Lord, who swears to his own hurt, and does not change, who does not put out his money at interest, and does not take a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things shall never be moved. And I think there's two ways we can look at this passage. Um, the first way is we can look at it and we can kind of stack ourselves up against the passage and see, you know, do we meet the criteria? Do, do, we, do we fit into this passage? And then the second way, and possibly the better way, is to look at it and say, does Jesus fit into the subject? of this text. Wherever it says who, can we plug Jesus? And wherever it says he, can we plug Jesus? Is Jesus the subject of this text? And so I want to look at it both ways, but first let's start off with us. And so let's just go back over so that way you guys don't forget. Um, o Lord, who shall sojourn in your tent? Who shall dwell on your holy hill? This is verse 1, and this is the question. This is where David is asking a question. And the question is, 
who will be in God's presence? Who's going to be in God's presence? Um, and we know he's asking that question because he gives two references to Old Testament where God's presence meets um, Israel on earth, or more specifically, Moses and the priest. So he talks about this, this, uh, this tent, and he's making a reference to the tabernacle. Um, not the outside course of the tabernacle where you're kind of around God's presence, but in the tent where God's presence actually resides. Um, where you have to be holy to be in there. And then the second reference is to the holy hill, and he's talking about Mount Zion, where God met Moses on the mount and gave him the Ten Commandments. And we know that God's presence was so holy um, there that Moses actually had to tell the Jews beforehand not to be on the hill, because if they were on the hill or, or, or like had a foot on it, they would just be disintegrated because God's presence was, was so holy. And so we know he's talking about who will be in God's presence. Um, and then verse 2 says, He who walks blamelessly and does what is right and speaks truth in his heart. And this is the answer, the answer to the question of who will be in God's presence. And the answer is um, one who walks blamelessly. And notice he says to walk blamelessly. Um, it's easy to talk blamelessly or to look blameless and seem as if you're blameless, but he says to walk, not just to talk the talk, but to walk the walk. Not to say about it, but to be about it. Um, and then the next thing he says is to speak truth in one's heart. Well, it's easy just to speak truth. Anyone can say 2 plus 2 equals 4. Or anyone can read the word of God because you're speaking truth. But to believe it in your heart is something else. If we're completely honest with ourselves, um, I don't think we're completely and utterly blameless. I don't think that we're fully able to speak truth completely in our heart. Verse 3, who does not slander with his tongue and does no evil to his neighbor nor takes up reproach against his friend. And here, this is just a list of all the things that a blameless person won't do. A blameless person won't lie, won't be evil to his neighbor. They're not going to slander. Um, let me ask you this. Have you ever said anything that you wish you could take back? I know for me, um, with my girlfriend, unfortunately, I said some things and I'm just like, ugh, you're an idiot. Why'd you say that? Um, and, you know, I can take it back and I can say I'm sorry, but those things, people that resides with people, like that actually hurts them. They feel that. And, uh, and if you're anything like me, um, you couldn't say that you're fully blameless because you've hurt others. Um, and then we go to verse 4. In whose eyes a vile person is despised, but who honors those who fear the Lord, who swears to his own heart and does not change. The first part of this passage is just this kind of contrast between um, someone who's blameless, despises what is vile, and honors those who fear the Lord. And then the second part is to swear to his own hurt and do not change. This one I, I kind of had trouble figuring it out, but then I looked into some commentaries and, and figured out kind of what he's saying. And, and basically it's, are we willing to sacrifice what we want for the good of others. But not only are we willing to sacrifice what we want for the good of others, are we willing to do it knowing that we're going to lose? It's going to be at our own expense. And that's, that's really hard. Um, maybe for us in the future, that may look like if we're leading a church and we have a desire of our flesh or a desire that, that we want, and we have to say no to that because we know that that may, that may tear down the church and, and that may hurt others, but, but we feel like we're kind of at a loss because we're not getting what we want. Um, then verse 5, who does not put out his money at interest and does not take a bribe against the innocent. Simply, this is just being righteous and not giving to gain and not taking to gain. Um, and obviously, when we look at this whole passage and we, we put ourselves up against it, we have to say we don't, we don't measure up. We don't stack up. Um, and so we kind of feel lost. We kind of feel like losers. Um, so now let's put Jesus into the subject. Let's put Jesus into the he and Jesus into the who. So if, if you'll follow along with me, I'm going to do that. Jesus shall sojourn in your tent, and Jesus shall be on your holy hill. Well, in Acts 7.55, Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father, so we know this is true. And Jesus will walk blamelessly, and Jesus does what is right. In John 19.17, Jesus walked blamelessly as he carried the cross and did what was right to save us of our sins. And Jesus speaks truth in his heart. Well, in John 19.30, Jesus spoke truth when he said it was finished. And Jesus does not slander with his tongue. Jesus does no evil to his neighbor. Jesus does not take up reproach against his friend. Well, in Matthew 27, 29 through 31, Jesus didn't retaliate or slander 
or say anything back when he was stripped of his clothes, when he was spit on, and when he was mocked before he walked with the cross. Jesus, in whose eyes a vile person is despised, in Matthew 23, 13, Jesus despised the Pharisees because of their wicked behavior. Um, Jesus honors those who fear the Lord. In John 13, Jesus honors his disciples by washing their feet. And Jesus swears to his own hurt and does not change. Well, in Matthew 26, 39, Jesus fell on his face, knowing he was going to be crucified, and still said, not my will, Lord, but yours. And then verse 5, Jesus does not put out his money at interest. Jesus does not take a bribe against the innocent. Well, in Matthew 7, 7, Jesus didn't give his life to gain, but he gave his life as a free gift for us. Um, and so Jesus does these things, and he shall never be moved. Um, that's good news, right? We can rejoice in that. We can rejoice in that. Well, um, when I first looked at this passage, you know, I hadn't really understood that. Um, I, I was just looking at it and comparing myself to the text. And because I did that, I felt like a loser. I felt just like I did when I was growing up and I had lost so much in sports, but I just wanted to win. I, I didn't want to be a loser. And I looked at this test and I was like, man, I'm not blameless, I'm not righteous, I don't speak truth in my heart all the time. How can I go up in front of you all and speak about this passage? I was like, geez, I need to ask for a different passage because how, how can I do that if, if I'm not practicing it myself? And I felt completely like a loser. Um, obviously, that's not the right response. The right response is to rejoice and to be glad. To rejoice in the fact that Christ meets the standard. And rejoice in the fact that because Christ meets the standard and yet he still died for us, that makes us winners. That makes us able to win at life because we can enter in heaven at the end. And, and we have won because Christ has won. Um, sometimes I find myself looking at, at people like Greg Laurie and, and these great pastors of other churches and I think to myself, how am I gonna how am I gonna do that? How am I gonna be like righteous and how am I gonna do all these things? And I, I don't know if I can measure up. And I don't know if I stack up. And uh, and the reality is none of us do. None of us do. They don't, we don't. But the difference between some and the others is how you rely on Christ and how you remember that Christ has won for you. And you go through life saying, I, I sinned, I messed up, I'm broken, and I don't meet the standard, but yet Christ does. And that pushes us forward. And that's how we lead. We lead by relying on Christ and leaning on Christ. Um, so just my, my challenge for you is to, to leave here responding to this text, living for Christ, knowing that you're free, you're not bound by the weight of your sin, that you're not bound by by not being blameless and all these things. Um, and so that's good. And I say amen. Amen.